I'm Bruce from the Pros Closet. I'm here today with Chris and Trevor from Fast Labs. And what I'm looking for is hopefully some advice, some tips uh, to help me get better at climbing, maybe help our uh, readers and viewers get better at climbing too. So to start off, why don't um, Chris and Trevor, you introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about what Fast Labs is and what it is you do. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll start it off. Uh, my name's Chris Case. I was um, the managing editor for Vela News for quite a while, almost eight years, and and that's when Trevor and I started working together. He's he can introduce himself, but with his physiology background and my journalism background and and some science background as well, we started collaborating together on our podcast, which is called Fast Talk, and some written pieces for Vela News, both that went into the print magazine and online, that dealt with the physiology of cycling, sports science. We did some some really interesting stuff on climbing specifically, so we're happy to be here. We both love climbing our bikes too, as on, a, on the practical side, so happy to offer as much advice and tips as we can, so yeah. Chris does it a lot better than me. We, we joke on our show about the fact that when Chris and I climb together, he. Uh, likes to get so far ahead of me, he can pull over to the side of the road, climb some small cliff, and then take a picture of me when I finally catch up. <laughs> I do it all for the Instagram, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the reason I was interested in talking about climbing was I've been off the bike for a while. I, you know, had a newborn. Yep. I really haven't been riding, and I went out and I did a local climb, uh, Flagstaff, some people might know it. And it was horrendous. It was like I was starting from scratch again. And I just remembered when I started riding, like how hard climbing was. And I was thinking like maybe you guys, I mean, why is climbing so hard? And maybe to start off, like you have any advice for people starting at the bottom or starting over like me? Sure. Yeah. So Chris and I actually wrote a really lengthy article about climbing. And I wanted to really dive into the physiology of that question of what is different about climbing? Why is it harder? Sure. Uh, and one of the biggest things that surprised me is it's just not that different. So there are some little things. There's, and I'll explain to you why when you go up a climb, uh, it feels miserable. Mm -hmm. But in terms of when people think, well, I haven't been climbing, therefore I don't have the strength to climb and I'm going to suffer on those hills not so much the case and we actually did a test and we were shocked by this where so Chris myself and Sepp Koos all climbed Flagstaff and then we used one of those little simple calculators that you just put in your weight you put in your wattage and it estimates what your time would have been up that climb and we were expecting it to be way off figures all these factors especially when you compare my even though Sep is significantly faster than me, it's still how close is it to whatever time you actually did. Um, Sep is a pure climber. He likes to stand up and punch it and then sit back down, slow down a bit, then punch it again. I'm a pure time trialist. I don't care about the pace. I'm just going to sit there at my threshold power and just motor away. And that little calculator got, I think it was my time exactly on and was like one second off with Sep. So it really just comes down to putting out power. The reason it feels hard, the only, everything I read, the only reason that I could find that it does feel harder is the fact that you are fighting gravity. There is no break. So when you're riding on the flats, even if you're not aware of it, when you start to fatigue, you can take little micro breaks. When your pedal is down near the bottom of that stroke, you can basically just kind of coast through the bottom and top part of the stroke, not generate any power, and then again, put the power down again. And you just get these little micro breaks that seem to make it easier. Or if you're really getting tired, you can just coast for two, three seconds, miss a few pedal strokes. Can't do that on a climb. If you aren't putting up power, you're slowing down really quickly. You're always fighting something. And whether you're consciously or subconsciously aware of it, if you take those little micro breaks where you stop pedaling, your cadence is gonna bog down. When your cadence bogs down climbing, you're in trouble. So that's that's what you're struggling with. That's what mm -hmm. gets. 
Yeah, to, to sort of answer the second part of your question about um, someone starting over again, or even somebody, I think you alluded to the fact that if somebody lives in a flat part of the country and they come to uh, uh, Colorado or someplace with mountains, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily at as big a disadvantage as they think because they have all the same tools that they need as everybody else. Psychologically, maybe they're not used to the effect or the, the climbing, the sensations and things, but it, it does come down to those the same elements as it does for everybody. So I mean, sure. things that you can do if you're on the flats to simulate some of that effects of I never get a break, uh, literally bike into a wind because you stop pedaling, <laughs> you slow down really quick. So there is some similarities between being in a wind versus uh, to, to, to climbing. Uh, another thing, quite frankly, is you have a similar effect on the trainer. Uh, trainers have a very small flywheel. They don't have the sort of inertia that your body weight has on the road. So you stop pedaling and that flywheel slows down really quickly. So quite frankly, I started when I was living up in Toronto and didn't have as much climbing around me, I would get on Zwift and go and do the longer climbs in Zwift. Still not as good as coming out here to Colorado and doing a real climb, but perceptually you had some of those feelings of I can't stop pedaling. Oh, this is steep. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you have a trainer that uh, can connect to one of those programs and get and it adds resistance as the, the, you get onto a climb, it's actually you're simulating a lot of of what you're going to experience on a real climb. Sure. What about um? I've heard about overgearing before. Is that a good idea if you're living somewhere flat, like uh, just popping in a harder gear? Yep. Yeah. Because uh, unless you have some absolutely insane gearing on your bike. Mm -hmm. Look, I'll add a little addendum here for anybody who's really scared of a climb and all you do, all you care about is just getting over a climb. Put the compact on the front, get the <laughs> whatever 45 or whatever giant gear you can get on the back. Yeah, you are not going to be setting a record up that climb. But if you have easy enough gears, you can get over any climb. Anybody can get over any climb if they have the right gearing. Uh, but certainly if you're using more standard gearing, one of the things that people really struggle with is your cadence is going to bog down. Mm -hmm. So for example, when we were racing SEP up Flagstaff, I'm not as strong as him. He and I were using the same gear ratios uh, where he was amazingly able to stay about 70 RPM the entire time. I think I'd bog down to 30, 40 RPM in a couple spots. Uh, so getting your legs familiar with that low cadence, high torque type riding is definitely going to help you. And you can do that on a trainer. It's a little harder to do out on the roads, on the flats, just because you have to get up to pretty high speeds mm -hmm. to both generate the torque and keep it at a low cadence. Well, so since you bring this up, uh, being scared of a climb, hmm. that's yes. something, uh, the, the mental aspect of climbing is something I definitely struggle with. I'm sure a lot of people struggle with. Are, are there ways, are there tricks? Are there ways you can like strategies, I guess, to help with the mental aspect of climbing? Biggest one is break it down. So I guess we're, we're going to abuse Flagstaff here. Uh, sure. I, you, you know Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. So for anybody who, who hasn't ridden this, it is a beast of a climb. And typical rider, I'm just going to give an average, is going to take about 40 minutes to get up this climb. And when you get up to about the 30-ish minute mark, there is a wall. You come around the corner, yeah. you see this wall, you have to look up the entire thing, and it is intimidating. To the point that actually when you get to the top of that wall, you take a bit of a left and you go, oh, great, a break. Hmm. That break is about nine ten percent great, but after the wall, nine ten percent feels pretty nice. So if you go to the base of that climb and think, I have to go up a brute of a forty minute climb with that wall towards the top of that and try to look at the whole thing as one big picture, it is intimidating. It is scary. You don't know how you're going to do it. 
So what you just want to do is break it down into little chunks, one, two, three minute chunks. I personally race up Flagstaff. I time trial it fairly frequently. Chris and I are actually going there tomorrow to time trial up it. And on that particular climb, I have little time marks. And the whole time going up, I am just focusing on getting to each time mark. And it's never more than about two minutes to the next time mark. Hmm. And when you break it down like that and just think in two minute segments, it's pretty manageable. Yeah, and if you're on a climb that you don't know, you, you obviously you wouldn't have those time markers, but you can you can use visual cues. You mm -hmm. can say, okay, you know, br br break it down into chunks in this same way. Get to that next telephone pole. Get to that next uh, house. Get to the next whatever the landmark is on the climb, and just try to remain as present as possible. Stop thinking about what is to come. Stop thinking about how long it might be or that really uh, steep section that somebody's told you about. Just focus on the here and now and use those little landmarks that are just up in front of you a little bit to help you stay present yeah. and, and deal with what, and, and deal with the pedaling that's taking place now rather than in another 20 minutes. Yeah. I've definitely used that before, like the telephone pole. I'll like cut little deals with myself. Like I'll just keep going to the telephone pole. Right. And what often happens is I'll get there and I'm like, oh, I can go a little bit more. I'll exactly. just go to the next one. And exactly. Yeah. So going back to your original question, mm -hmm. if you're putting out 300 watts, 300 watts hurts just as much on the flats as it does on the climb. The difference, the reason you can tolerate it sometimes a little more on the flats is there's always at the back of your head somewhere, if this really starts hurting, I can stop. Mm -hmm. I can stop. Where when you're on a climb and you're having to put over, out 300 watts to get over this 15% brood of a grade, what's at the back of your head is, if I stop, I fall over. <laughs> so I have to keep putting it out. And the more you look ahead and go, I have to be generating this power for five, 10, 15 minutes, the more something at the back of your head is going to say, this is impossible, quit. Where if you, as you said, you use those visual cues, you just look up to that next telephone pole and go, just make it to there, that becomes more manageable. And then you're giving yourself what you have in the flats of, well, when I get there, then I can ease up, I can fall over. So I, I have an opportunity to quit. And usually when you get there, you then look at the next telephone pole and go, okay, now I'm going to make it to that one. And you just keep doing that bargaining with yourself and you'd be amazed how long you can go and how tough a climb you can get over just re-bargaining with yourself mm -hmm. 20 times. And every athlete does this. Yep. At, at every level of every caliber, they make these deals with themselves. So yeah, that's a good strategy. One of, one of the other things I would say is in terms of um, physical things you can do, some people uh, will benefit from adjusting their position or getting out of the saddle, using different muscle groups, um, using the, uh, the, you know, getting out of the saddle to generate some more power if it's steeper, et cetera. So <coughs> there's some little tricks that you can do there. And, and one thing that we did see when we did this study um, a few years ago is that certain types of riders actually do better given those strategies. Trevor mm -hmm. mentioned he's more of a, a time trialist type rider. So he likes to find, find that rhythm, find the pace that works for him and be very steady about it. Other people, Sep, myself, we actually benefit to some degree by attacking, so to speak, or going really hard and then sitting back, settling in, then going hard and settling in again. And we can recover better in that way and take advantage of um, different different uh, attributes that we have as an athlete or as a cyclist to do a better performance or do a better job on a specific climb. So there's those types of um, physical differences between riders and you can treat, given who you are, you can treat the climb in different ways. Hmm. So to take this a step further, I'm sure you're going to ask the question, is lighter better? Yep. And yeah. <laughs> to a degree, <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just I don't know if you can tell through the camera, but I'm I'm not a light rider. I'm like 190 pounds. So Chris, you're what, 135 right I'm, now? I'm 135. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Advantage me. <laughs> so here's what's going to surprise you. To a degree, to a certain point, no lighter is not better. Hmm. When you start to get to the, in cycling terms, the, the edges or, or certain points, yes, lighter is better. So it, it is right around 185, 195 pounds, where as you get heavier, uh, your climbing is going to suffer. So this, this is, uh, I'm going to throw one term at you. This is called allometric scaling, which is most things physiologically scale relative to weight. Uh, some things scale equally with weight. Some things scale more than weight. Some things scale less than weight. Uh, our power, what power we can generate, uh, scales equally with weight until, like I said, about that 190 pounds. And then you hit a, a point where simply muscles can't continue to get uh, stronger at the pace uh, of an increase in weight, if that right. makes sense. It's a little confusing term, but but yeah, yeah it, it is important. But basically, if you took all the cyclists and, and put them on a graph and had all their different weights and then all the, the power they could do at threshold, basically those two lines, so here's your threshold line, here's your weight line, they would go like this, and then around 190 pounds, weight would keep going like this and power would... Or, hmm like that interesting Didn't increase but not as much yeah tapers so, off so and as a matter of fact it's right around it's not the lightest guys it's uh right around that 68 to 72 kilograms where you see the best power to weight ratio which is why you look at the history of tour de france winners that's where most of them are at because they can climb as well as the climbers but they can also, but they can time trial on the flats better than the climbers. Yeah. Mm. You think of, if you think of people like, yeah, and it, we're talking sort of out, almost outside of the, the climbing context a little bit. You think of someone like um, Nairo Quintana, who's a really small climber. He can climb really well. Is he the best climber? He's there. He's certainly there. But there are guys that are, you know, inches taller than him and, and tens of pounds heavier than him that can climb just as well. Put them on a time trial bike, of course, and because of the power that Nairo can generate, given his uh, stature, he, he can't compete with the guys that are slightly bigger that can put out more power mm -hmm. on a flat road. And so that's where the differences can be made sometimes. That's why you, you rarely see that little climber guy win the tour. Um, so going back to what Chris is talking about, about different styles, and, and the reason I gave you this whole explanation of allometric scaling is something that doesn't scale equally with weight is VO2 max. Lighter riders tend to have a better VO2 max hmm. relative to weight. So what that means is, well, if you took an hour climb and you had the little climber guy and that 70 kilogram good time trialer go up the climbs together, they would actually get to the top in about the same length of time. The advantage might even be slightly to that time trialer. The difference is that little climber, the little 120 pound guy, has a really great VO2 max. So they have that ability to go over threshold for a couple minutes and put out a scorching effort. Where the 70 kilogram more time trialer guy, which is what I am, if they go above threshold, they pay for it. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you watch the tour, you see the little climbers will sit there on the long climbs and they'll attack and attack and attack where your, your more GC, typical GC looking guy, Chris Froome like a Chris Froome, is just going to sit there and grind up that climb. And you see the climber attack and you go, oh no, that climber's about to kill him. And then you'll, you, you'll see him not respond at all. And so if we're talking about Froome, Froome's just not going to respond. He's just going to keep grinding away at his pace. And all of a sudden, five minutes later, he's caught that little climber guy. Yep. So I guess I probably shouldn't gain any weight. But <laughs> right? Yeah. Are, are there things heavier climbers heavier riders trying to climb can do to try and, I don't know, make life easier for themselves? I mean, so I might, guess, yeah, go ahead. 
this might surprise you and Chris might have a, a different answer here, but my answer is the heavier you are, the more you have to take that time trialer mentality, mm -hmm. which means when you hit that climb, you go your pace. You don't respond to people. So the biggest mistake uh, I, I see heavier riders make, they're, they know there's a climb in a race, they're concerned about it, and they're, they're going, oh no, somebody's gonna attack, I don't wanna get popped. And so the second somebody attacks at the base of the climb, they try to respond to it. Like I said, Chris can do a little attack like that, being the, the smaller climber, more pure climber type, recover and be just fine. I do that attack, I'm done. I'm, I've never seen him again. So the heavier you are, the more you have to just hit the base of that climb and go, I don't care what anybody else is doing. I'm going to go my pace up this climb. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree completely with that. I think it comes down to uh, physiology and psychology in that way. Like the, the mass of a rider, a bigger rider to – to go with the attack, it takes more to accelerate that. It takes more to maintain that. So surging back and forth like that is, is not going to benefit a larger rider. So in terms of the psychology, yeah, you just have to have, you know, if you're, if we're talking racing here, then it's about, okay, I have the confidence to know what I can do. If the little guy attacks me, I know that he, he has a burst, but eventually he has to settle down. And if I just maintain as much as I can do, there's a chance, there's a good chance that I'll be able to pull them back some, if not all the way. So having that confidence. And, and then outside of the racing, if you're just doing a grand fondo and you're just, or, or, or some big event where, or just going out for a ride and you, you want to enjoy yourself the, the most, I think bigger people, heavier riders, it's just going to be more enjoyable for them to find that rhythm, find that right pace for them and and you know sometimes it's just about putting the head down and, and pedaling away the other advice i'm going to give for both the, the little rider and the big rider is this is a place where i would say train i mean obviously always train your weaknesses but really train your strengths here little 120 pound rider does not have a lot of muscle mass so their advantage is they can actually kind of spin up that climb uh, but their disadvantage is they need to spin up that climb. If they bog down to 40 RPM, they don't have the muscle mass to generate the torque to really keep those pedals going over. If you're 190 pounds, you've got some good muscle mass in your legs. You can grind out that gear a bit more than that little mm -hmm. rider can. So take advantage of that when you're going up the climb. Train it, get used to that, be able to grind those you still have to train the neuro, neurological side. So take advantage of your, your greater muscle mass and, and learn to be a little bit comfortable going sometimes 40, 50 RPM. So cool. Let's say I want to train. I want to train for climbing. Is yep. it as simple as just climb a lot as much as I can? Yeah. What we were saying before about it really does come down to power to weight. Uh, I'm going to simplify it even more and say, well, certainly hitting climbs is going to help you. You can actually get to be a pretty good climber without doing a ton of climbing. Mm -hmm. So do some of those things we talked about, as you suggested, uh, get a little bit comfortable at lower cadences because that's inevitable on climbs. Uh, get, put yourself in those scenarios where you have to get used to pedaling without being able to take breaks. That's going to help. You don't necessarily need a climb to do that. Right. Also get used to getting out of the saddle because then you are using very different uh, neuromuscular firing patterns. So you do have to be used to doing that. And that's again, something you can do on a trainer with something like Zwift or just if you're out in the roads, if you have little climbs around you, just hit those and get out of the saddle and, and get some practice with it. Obviously, just being comfortable with climbs, going out and doing climbs, it's probably more psychological than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but certainly, if you're living here in Colorado and you're doing an hour climb every weekend, you're not going to be scared when you see it in a race. But I do think that's more mental than, than physiological. Yeah. Great. Cool. And I guess... 
The last thing I want to cover is because I split a lot of my time between road, gravel, and mountain biking. Mm -hmm. And I, f I feel like I've noticed that the demands of climbing on the road and off the road feel different to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So am I right in thinking that? And if I am, do I need to train those two sports, those two disciplines differently? Chris, you want to start this one? Cause... Well, in terms of the training, I think that's more appropriate for you to answer. Uh, certainly, there, in terms of riding uh, a, a steep climb on a mountain bike versus a steep climb on a road bike, there's some differences in the style of riding or where you need to put yourself on a bike. Mm -hmm. Traction is a, an issue yes. at times. So a lot of times on a mountain bike, if it's a super steep climb, you can't get out of the saddle to generate the more, more power. So you're seated and you're, you are having to grind because of the low cadence. So there's some of that. So obviously you could train specifically for that. Same thing with um, the, these gravel races. A lot of them take place in the Midwest. So they're not long sustained climbs. Um, a lot of shorter, sometimes pretty steep rollers to, you know, short, maybe uh, several minutes long, but never tens of minutes or hour long climbs in these races. So those are different. Those are more power climbs, we'd call them. Uh, sometimes it's advantageous to maybe get out of the saddle and almost sprint over them to use your momentum to carry your speed over a climb versus to, to sit down grind it out and, and repeat that process through all these little undulations. So there's some, there's definitely differences when it comes to those attributes of the different sports. The other thing is when it, when it go, somewhat going back to the, the um, issue of light climbers versus heavier riders is it a light climber. You think about what they're lifting off of the bike when they do get out of the saddle it's a lot less their arms are usually very skinny and they can um, usually do a better job of getting out of the saddle more often and that's a, just a, a matter of physics to some degree so point being same same rules apply here mm -hmm. when it comes to mountain biking and gravel racing when it comes to small versus large riders if that if that makes sense and, and then in terms of the training i'll let trevor chime in so the one point i i want to make adding to what chris is saying is we can talk about when you're just talking about road cycling we can talk about steady climbs versus undulating climbs talk about steep climbs and when you're talking about a steep climb you're talking about 15 percent when you're comparing road climbing to mountain bike climbing every road climb is steady and consistent mm -hmm. on a relative scale. 15% uh, is super steep on a, a road climb. Mountain bike trails, you're, you're hitting 30% or steeper for very short periods of time, but that, that's not uncommon at all. Um, so it is far less consistent, far less steady. Um, often the climbs are much shorter and you have to power over them especially because if you don't power over them, you're going to have to get off the bike and finish walking up it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very different style of climbing. As Chris pointed out also, um, the, the ground moves underneath you. It's, you've got gravel, you've got dirt. So traction is important. Uh, where you position yourself on the bike is important. You know, we can certainly on the road talk about, optimal positioning for putting out power, but if you stand up and get too far forward on your bike on the road, you're gonna look a little off, but you're gonna get up that climb just fine. You do that in a mountain bike trail and your rear wheel's gonna skid out and you're done. So you do need to train technique. Technique is a huge part of it. Uh, the other things that you need to train for mountain biking and also to a degree for gravel is that shorter, punchier, hard effort to get over those 30 second, 20 second, one minute climbs that are quite steep, where you gotta hit them hard or you're not getting over it. Yeah. And there's, you have that in road, in road climbing, but not nearly to the same degree. 
And the one thing you, you don't have nearly as much in mountain biking is that let's just do a steady 40 minute climb where you're, you're time trialing. I've only ever won one mountain bike in my life race in my life. And it's because it was a mountain bike race with a 40 minute steady climb. <laughs> and none of the mountain bikers knew what to do. And I was the roadie going, this is cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. It definitely gives me a lot of food for thought. I'm definitely, I'm going to probably hit some climbs this weekend. There you go. There you See go. how I do. Yeah. yeah. You guys said you're uh What's that? What are you going to hit? Well, so I'm probably going to take my mountain bike out to uh, the OHV trails. Mm -hmm. And those are, you climb up walls for a good 30 minutes. Yeah. 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 But uh, you guys said you're going to time trial flag stuff. Tomorrow, yeah. We're just uh, doing a little test of Mm -hmm. our our levels at the moment. Trevor's been, I would say, training relatively seriously. I've been running and watching my daughter so we're gonna see how we match up based on our very uh different training styles right now i am praying i get my one opportunity in a <laughs> lifetime to get to the top first and take a picture of chris coming up yeah yeah we'll see how it goes all right awesome well, i guess gave you we gave you some things to think about when you're out there climbing let us know how it works for sure it's funny i I forgot it's been so long. I forgot about those, the little bargaining thing I did when I was riding a lot. I like somehow forgot I did that. Yeah. And it's so I'm definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, um, I don't know. I'm sure I'll, I'll bounce back. Yeah. I'm riding a lot more nowadays. Yeah, you know, I'm working from home. So it's, yeah, it'll, how, I'll bounce how back. How old is your child? He's uh, 18 months now. Okay. Yeah, is yeah. Getting There's a little so more different. independent, yeah. And right. There's so many different phases you go through for him mm-hmm. that he goes through, and then obviously that reflects on the phases that the parents go through too and how they need to adjust up, yeah. down, left, right, all over the place. So it's mm-hmm. never never ends. And the, the one thing that climbing, flats, mountain biking, gravel riding all have in common is a new infant is very bad for them. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, that's, I definitely, I expected it, but also didn't, so. Yeah, right. There's there's certain things you could never anticipate. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess, uh, do you guys want to sign off by uh, telling us maybe where people can find you or, you know, Fast Labs related stuff? Sure. Yeah. Our website's fastlabs.com. Uh, our, the podcast that we've put together for 111 episodes now, about six years we've been doing it, is called Fast Talk. And you can find that on all the popular podcast apps from Apple Podcasts to Google Podcasts to, to Spotify, etc. You know, a simple search of Fast Talk should get you there. So, Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, guys.